Thanks. I uh, appreciate you having me here. Um, I um, thought that one of the things we would do today in the second panel, I, do you, did you want to say something? No. Uh, was um, try and be pretty informal and just, uh, you got the same panel. I mean, I don't think anybody else needs to be introduced uh, unless they want to be reintroduced. Um, uh, what I thought would be interesting to do, uh, instead of listening to a reporter like me pontificate, was to uh, hear what some of the whistleblowers and other people here um, have to say about how they have viewed the role of the, of the press and of reporters in their dealings with them and what they think the press could do better uh, and handling um, uh, sensitive stories that they know about. And just talk a little bit about the kind of the, the dynamic of the relationship between uh, people who have, who are deeply embedded in these organizations and know something that's going wrong and want to talk about it, and, and the reporters who they then uh, either seek out or stumble upon or get thrust to, uh, and what, what kind of relationship develops. And um, I thought that would be more interesting than, um, than just hearing, you know, what I think about being a reporter. Uh, and so I wanted to maybe just start uh, with some of the whistleblowers here about, and let them vent a little bit about reporters. Uh, <laughs> And um, because everybody has an opinion about the press. Uh, and so I thought maybe you could just talk a little bit about what, what it was like, what do you think, what, what was your first interaction with a reporter? What, you know, was he a jerk or was he a good guy or a, he or she? Um, so maybe just anybody who wants to talk about that could talk about it. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll start out because uh, I had a hard time coming to grips with the notion that I was going to talk to the press someday. Uh, you know, I, I had been taught all my NSA life never to go to the press. Never. It's not something you do. You go through a special office, a liaison office, uh, high up in the uh, management structure to handle those kinds of things. For that matter, you don't talk to Congress you go through a congressional liaison office who talks to Congress. And we were uh, admonished once when we were talking to Diane Rourke um, as part of a routine set of visits she would make to come and check up on how NSA was spending taxpayer funds. And she uh, looked upon Bill Binney's project, Thin Thread, as very favorable in that regard. And uh, later on, uh, those kinds of sessions were turned against us as well, attempts to get money surreptitiously, not going through the normal corporate process. And Hayden actually pulled us into his office and lectured us for about 45 minutes, drugged the deputy director of operations, Rich Taylor at the time, off the golf course, brought him in. He was part of the crowd and several others and it created some tears on the part of some of the ladies in the room. It was not a pleasant session. And it was totally fabricated. When I mean, did you first, what was the first reporter that you uh, talked to? Uh, first one, yes, Jane Mayer of the New Yorker. Uh -huh. She was the first one. But you gotta understand, uh, it was probably Kate Martin, the constitutionalist here in DC that told us, you are inevitably going to have to talk to the press. It's the only way that Congress can be moved to do anything. And I just didn't want to believe it. So, but, but she turned out to be right. And eventually, um, I gave in to my internal resistance and met with Jane Mayer. And I will tell you, um, Jim, that uh, without exception, every reporter, including her, that I've met with personally since then has been a lady or a gentleman and a professional in their field. And so I have found it a, a, an overwhelmingly overwhelmingly positive experience. Wow, I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to? I, mine, um, for me, my first interaction 
with the reporters when I blew the whistle um, to Michael Isakoff, who at the time was with Newsweek. And he did a wonderful article and exposed the information I wanted to get out. Um, however, I specifically said I did not want to be co quoted and I wanted to remain anonymous, which he abided by in the article. Yet the actual emails I divulged, including my name, ended up on Newsweek's website, which was, yeah, a big red arrow pointing right at me. So I tend to stay away from reporters who purposely or inadvertently burn their sources. Um, that's why there are probably fewer than 10 in this country that I go to with whistleblower stories. I do believe they're quite essential. Jim's one of them. I do believe they're absolutely essential. I knew in Tom Drake's case, we had to win not only in the courtroom, but in the court of public opinion. And Jane Mayer was someone who was indispensable in helping me during my whistleblower case, get out the truth about what happened. And um, that's why I went to her with the article she ended up writing on Thomas Drake, and that article won the Polk Award um, for her. But there really, I mean, there are a number of journalists for your paper, um, the, the pa paper of record, the gray lady, um, who I feel like have burned um, whistleblowers as sources, and I will not go to those reporters again, um, but I will go to you and Eric Lishblau and Charlie Savage. Well, let's not get too personal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A quick point, uh, as one more journalist, one thing we know is that we almost didn't get the Snowden disclosure about NSA because Glenn Greenwald is a sort of very smart reporter and lawyer, but not, not a super technical guy, and was essentially dragging his heels uh, about installing an encryption suite so that they could have secure communications. And it seems like you see a lot of reporters who are admirably, as a matter of principle, willing to you know, do whatever it takes, will if necessary go to jail to protect their sources, um, but don't have the kind of basic, I guess, tradecraft, you might call it, um, that would enable them to have secure communications. And this makes it difficult for the whistleblowers, I think, because you have no way of knowing. You, you, may, you may have a sense of who has the integrity to protect their sources, but you probably don't have a, a very clear way of knowing who has the technical uh, savvy to be able to effectively use the tools necessary to engage in secure communications, certainly if the national security establishment is going to be the, the adversary trying to track down uh, those communications. Uh, and so, in a way, you know, we, every journalist you know, has a, an ethics component you know, in, in J school, um, and it seems to me that, that it should be at least as elementary to have a kind of basic you know, here's how you use Tor and PGP and, and OTR encrypted chat, and here's how you verify the fingerprints and avoid man-in-the-middle attacks and avoid traffic analysis. Um, we're starting to see tools developed. I think the, the New Yorker recently unveiled a, a kind of Dropbox for uh, anonymous uh, uh, delivery of, uh, of tips, but um, if we expect whistleblowers to take these sort of enormous risks, journalists need to sort of step up and have the capabilities that are necessary to ensure that, that you know, not just that they're not going to give away their sources, but that the technology isn't going to give away their sources. It, it, you know, I think you're dead on. And that was one of my biggest challenges is that the very first call I got was from uh, uh, Wired magazine. And I had this conversation with the reporter. And I'm talking about encapsulated payloads and all of that kind of stuff. And this guy got it. I was like, wow, this is going to be easy. And then the very next call was with, uh, who was that, Tom Ellen, uh, Ellen Nakashima from the, and uh, I, I needed Tom to be the intermediary because she really had no knowledge of technology. And what I thought was fundamental and basics, and I'm explaining this story, and um, it was over the phone, but I could see the dazed look. So uh, <clears throat> that, was a, that was a real challenge, understanding what the uh, implications, and my disclosure was a very, very technical disclosure. So, uh, you know, understanding what this stuff means from a technology perspective, or at least having resources to do that. And then, uh, uh, as uh, Julian mentioned, uh, having the ability to maintain and sustain privacy throughout the exchange of this, uh, uh, you know, of these things. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, we volunteered delivering security for Gap because I didn't want to, uh, uh, I didn't want to disclose some of the stuff that I uh, wanted to disclose without having some of the security and privacy elements in place. Uh, you know, I guess more from a, a survival perspective and uh, so did you did else. you let me ask you this. So did you initiate discussions with the reporters about how to communicate? Can we ask Tom yeah. Drake on that one? Because yeah, sure. I know for I, I yeah, Tom, come, come on back on the panel <laughs> um, because he did exactly this yeah. with the reporter to whom he made his whistleblower disclosures. It's fair to say I knew that NSA had penetrated the heart of the uh, internet uh, infrastructure within the United States. And I knew that any attempt to communicate with a reporter um, was going to be fraught with surveillance peril. And so I had to think long and hard, given my own technical background, what means I have at my disposal that would at least make it much more difficult in terms of, of real-time uh, decryption or real-time monitoring surveillance, knowing that even on internet, you have to at least get a message out to somebody and the fact that you're communicating can still be detected. And so I did use a mechanism to contact uh, the reporter of record uh, at the Baltimore Sun anonymously through highly encrypted means. And I knew that even if the even if NSA detected it, that their ability to actually, although I assumed I was compromised all the time, that their ability to actually read in real time uh, what I was was sharing with with the reporter. Of course, it came back to bite me because by virtue of having encrypted communications with a reporter, uh, I was part of my charge is that obviously I was sharing classified information. Otherwise, why would I go into encrypted session? I didn't want to make it any easier for the NSA surveillance regime to know what I was actually saying. Remember, by virtue of having communication with a reporter, I was already in administrative violation of an NSA policy having unauthorized contact reporter. It's not criminal to have contact reporter, but I was in administrative violation. And I knew by virtue of that that you know, if I was doing it openly and I made it obvious that I was, that they could yank my clearance by virtue of the need to have a clearance, that my ability to remain employed by NSA would, would be much, much shorter uh, in, in terms of duration. So, but here's extraordinary frustration. Even to this day, and I will not, will not mention names, okay, to protect those who apparently think it's too hard to, to communicate encrypted, it's too much of a waste of time, it's too much of a pain, right, in, in the internet and digital age. Um, in fact, it's to the point in some cases I will not communicate with certain people unless they put encryption packages on, on their computers and on their, on, on their phones. It's just prudent. I said in another panel session, you encrypt, you know, encrypt the crap out of your life, especially the parts of your life that you just don't want the government looking in on. It doesn't mean you're hiding anything. Remember, that's, that's a meme. It's just it's a surveillance state. They want to know as much as they can about you. But I was, I had extensive communication with a reporter via an encrypted means, and that was, and I know the government got extraordinarily frustrated. One reason they came to my house and took everything that I had that was electronic, hoping that I would have saved everything on my computer, which I hadn't. <laughs> okay. Could you? And I, I'm actually I'm having to educate. Okay. I realize I have a very technical background, and given where I was, and I work with some of the premier developers in the encryption space. Not just when I was at NSA. Not just the gentleman sitting next to the left of me, who is the the crypto mathematician, extraordinary individual. Right? He's modest. Okay? And my math was pretty good. And then I met Bill. Okay? So, but it's extremely frustrating in this day and age, just as much as you, know, you want the privacy of who you are in your everyday life, that where you draw that line, you need to do the same when you're on, in the digital space, in the virtual space. But there's very few people to this day, and people that should know better, that will actually communicate with me in, in, encrypted. Very few. And you also have to be careful because many of the encryption systems are totally compromised. And I've had people tell me, which ones do you use? I don't say what I use publicly for all the obvious reasons or what mechanism I use. Okay? If you saw my computer in terms of how I access internet and when I communicate securely, it's pretty locked down. Okay? 
My entire, com my entire computer is encrypted, right? And I, none of the keys are available, okay? So what does that tell you? It tells you that we're to the point now that if you want to hide, to say hide, you want to remain invisible as much as possible with the garment, then you have to use the means by which you, that they are available to do so. It's just prudent. I think there are a lot of situations where you want confidentiality between a lawyer and a client or between a journalist and a source. Um, I'm very technologically challenged, but Tom helped me set up encryption, and I can attest to the fact that it's incredibly easy. It's really easy, and I urge other lawyers and reporters um, to do that. David, could you talk a little bit about what it's how whistleblowers are now seen within by the press and kind of the general sense of the press corps today and how they view whistleblowers and, and especially, uh, you know, how they, you know, given, given the, the post 9-11, you know, tensions over security, um, it seems, as, as it was said in the earlier panel, that it seems like everybody is, you know, is, is considered, you know, a leaker and not a whistleblower. And I was just wondering what you think, within the press corps, how they're viewed today. Yeah, I, th I think there's, I mean, there's, to me, there's a lot of different challenges in the news business and how the news business relates to dealing with whistleblowers. I mean, that's the first thing. I mean, you've got fewer and fewer reporting resources to actually just report stories for potentially more and more whistleblowers. There's a, there's, the first challenge with, with any set of whistleblowers is, is sifting, right? Is, is, is this a legitimate whistleblower? Is this a legitimate story? I mean, that takes hours and hours and days and days of work just to figure out what kind of story you potentially have. So with fewer and fewer resources, there is, it's not a, necessarily a hostility to, to whistleblowers in the press, but kind of a, it's a resource question at a moment of dwindling resources. I, I get contacted all the time by people who have various different stories and it's, it, it's a, a, a simple time and money challenge just to figure out which ones to pursue, which ones not to pursue. And we're in a situation where news organizations have in many cases fewer and fewer resources. So there's that pr issue. Then there's the issue of retribution, which you know something about, in terms of if you publish whistleblowers, what kind of problems am, am I, is, is the journalist bringing on to him or herself, is the news organization bringing on to itself? And again, it's not necessarily ideological hostility towards whistleblowers, it's more like, can I just find something else to do that's a little easier, that's less resource intensive? And then I would add one other point about this, at, at least at the local level, which I'm very concerned about, because there are, there are federal whistleblowing issues at the national level, Washington, D.C., but there's also the question of what about people who are blowing the whistle on various forms of waste, fraud, and abuse at the state and local level? And one of the things that I'm very concerned about, and I wrote a long Harper's piece about this in Harper's Magazine, was about how when you have fewer and fewer news organizations at the local level, I mean, there's still, a, there's still a pretty decent number of publications at the national level, but when you have fewer and fewer publications at the local level, I come from, I, I live in a one, a, a one newspaper town that dominates, it basically dictates the coverage of all the rest of the news organizations in that town. I, I live in Denver. When there is less competition at the local level, a whistleblower in state or municipal government will then go to the one newspaper in town and say, I, I, I've got a story for you. And if, depending on the ownership of that newspaper, depending on the political affiliation of that newspaper, depending just on the resource question of that newspaper, whether they want to publish that and make that a story or not, there, if there is no competition to worry that you're going to get scooped if you don't publish that, it's easier to say, well, see you later. I'm, I'm not interested in, in I'll just, I'd rather publish a, an AP story, I'd rather publish a story about the, uh, about the Denver Broncos. So all of that adds up to a situation where, separate and aside from how the government treats whistleblowers, the topic of our first panel, separate and aside from that is 
there is a, and again, I hesitate to call it hostility, but there is a, uh, you might call an institutional bias, I think, in the press for various reasons, not on an individual reporter level, but there is a, a more of an institutional bias against whistleblowers now than arguably there was before, simply because of all of these moving parts, all of the change, changes in the media ecosystem. The, um, did you guys want to, did you ever get a chance to talk about um, how, you know, what, what was the end result of your discussions with reporters? I mean, you have, you, all of you whistleblowers have an initial conversation with a reporter. The bottom line, though, is something comes out. Do you all feel like, even if you didn't like the reporter or you did, that the story got out the right way in the end, or did it not get out the right way? What's, do you have, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, for, for the most part, uh, I think uh, there is a uh, media machine that's in place that knows how to obfuscate and distort the story at many, many, many different levels. And that's what ends up confusing a lot of folks. And uh, ultimately, that's what ends up uh, uh, convoluting the story because, you know, reporters have to report on both sides of the story. And, um, you know, you end up sometimes in a he said, she said type scenario. In uh, my case, I felt that we managed to get the story out and uh, uh, the Democrats said, absolutely not, we, we have to fight, this is ridiculous, we can't have the Bush administration tapping uh, warrantlessly uh, until they got some pork and then, you know, it became not so much of an issue and they passed the immunity. So, uh, yeah, you know, it, it led to an action, I'm not sure if it was a favorable action uh, on behalf of the American people. What do you guys think about the role of the press today? I mean, you haven't, uh, I just would like to hear your thoughts on how you think this interaction between the press and whistleblowers has changed over the years and what you think needs to be improved. Well, we've talked a lot about getting the story right, and I think that's absolutely vital. And as a nonprofit organization, we work with the press on two ends, and on both sides, we look for the press to get the story right. And there's a great story here, actually, um, the Washington Post published a piece um, in 2012 about a document known as Presidential Policy Directive 20. And based on that piece, because we are an open government organization and we try to get information from the public, we were able to file a Freedom of Information Act request for the document in order to try to push release. And we looked to these stories to see what the document is, what the associated documents are, what we can go after, and who we need to go to. Mm -hmm. So we really need those details to be in the story, and whoever is reporting that story to have pressed for those details so we can then go to the appropriate agency and try to get more information for the public. We were in the midst of um, very, very tight um, debates with the agencies to get that document when actually it was released, but not by the government. It was released by Edward Snowden um, in The Guardian. We got the full text of the document. So, and then you come back on the other side, and once something has been released that you fought for, you also want the press to be right on, on the other side. And you want to make sure that they're looking at the documents, that they're um, looking at the text, and they're getting out to the public the details in the documents. And we work very, very hard whenever we get something in to go through it and to find out what the interesting pieces are so we can turn them over to the press. But then we also turn over the full text of the documents and we need them to be technically aware enough to go through these very complicated um, um, records to pull out what they think is interesting as well. So we turn over the, the individual pieces and then the full pieces and leave it up to them to tell what the story is. And that story is vital because that's our lifeblood. That's why nonprofit organizations, research organizations like Epic exist, is to make sure that the public is being made aware of what the government is doing. Okay, I think uh, we'd like to open it up to dis uh, questions. Uh, so just raise your hand and I'll call on you. And uh, we've got a, I think we have microphones somewhere. Yeah, just, 
There's a microphone and. Um, um, Could you uh, identify yourself and who Hi, you're my name is Tyler Bass. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, so, throughout the panel uh, today, a number of you have emphasized the power of conscience in determining who is and who is not a whistleblower, a difference between a whistleblower and a leaker. And I, I ran this question by uh, Mr. Weeby and Mr. Benny a moment ago. But uh, my basic question is relating to The Guardian and The Washington Post with relationship to Snowden. Uh, Snowden gave apparently both publications 41 slides from a PowerPoint presentation out of which we learned about PRISM. Uh, the Washington Post disclosed that it chose not to publish all the slides. Mr. Gelman from the Post told me it was because they thought that that would endanger national security. And Mr. Snowden told the Post as they published that he wishes they could have done that unilaterally. Now had Snowden just released these slides to the public in some other form, or if he were to, would he be somehow less of a whistleblower than a leaker? That's my question. Thank you. So the, the question is, by doing it unilaterally, you think w whether or not it would be publication as, a, as journalism versus uh, the way he did it? I thought he released them through other newspapers. And I think part of the problem has been um, a view by the press here that other newspapers, whether it's WikiLeaks or The Guardian, are somehow not, not up to snuff or not official or not responsible enough um, or don't do quite as good of a job at vetting the documents. But I mean, the really, y you become a whistleblower not by to whom you release the information, but the mere act of m making a disclosure that could be to a member of Congress, that could be to an interest group representative, that can be to a newspaper. Um, and I know the White House likes to think it can say, that person's not a whistleblower, but really it's not up to the wrongdoer, usually the US government, to decide whether or not, um, whether or not the crime is legal um, or not. But you, be, you become a whistleblower by making a disclosure, again, of what you reasonably believe evidence is fraud, waste, abuse, or illegality. There's no definition of to whom you have to make that disclosure or how, or whether you disclosed too much, as people accuse Bradley Manning of and Snowden of, or too little, as they accuse Brad Birkenfeld of. That doesn't matter. Motivation doesn't matter. But unfortunately, the press kind of seizes on these ideas. Yeah. Oh, let me, you had your hand up before. Hi, I'm Dan Segallon for the PBS NewsHour. Test, test, there we go. So I'm Dan Segallon with the PBS NewsHour. I'd like to ask the NSA, former NSA folks, about the whole issue of metadata and, excuse me, as my camera tilts, is the government doing more than just collecting metadata on a broad scale, for example? Are they collecting the content of the phone calls? Are they recording the phone calls themselves? And if they are, how widespread is it that they're doing that? Is it a targeted? an hour recording of calls, or is it more widespread? Uh, well, I, I, I can only go with what's been uh, said in the news by, uh, for example, Director Mueller in his testimony in uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee on the 30th of March of 2011. He said, in response to a question of, well, how can you prevent a future Fort Hood? He said, uh, one, of the re one of the things they've done is they've gotten together with the DOD and, and created a technology database where he can go in and with one query retrieve all past and all future emails on a person as they come in. Uh, that means he's looking at uh, U.S. citizens' emails because it's, he's talking about preventing a future Fort Hood, a U.S. citizen becoming radicalized and killing people in the United States. So he's saying that they've got access to this technology database email. Well, if it's the DOD email, that's the business of NSA, it's an NSA program. That email comes off things like uh, Mark Klein exposed about the NSA room, the AT&T facility in San Francisco. That's where that email comes from. It's right off those inter internal lines in the United States. And then there was Tim Clementi, an ex-FBI agent uh, who on uh, CNN said that uh, all digital data is uh, recorded and, they can, and the intelligence community and the uh, FBI can get back to it. So they're saying that they're taking in all of this data uh, and they're, they have ways and means of getting back to it. That means they can get back to the recordings of phone calls included. He was referring specifically 
to uh, one of the Tsarnaev brothers and his conversation with his wife just before the bombing. He said that they could get back to that, the audio, and, and find out what was in that phone call. So that's saying that they're recording certainly part of it. I don't think they're doing the, there must be at least three billion phone calls done in the United States every day. So I don't think they're doing all of that, but certainly a targeted set. And after all, if the Russians tipped us off about him, he should be on that target list, and I'm sure they were recording him. Yeah. You know, well, let me, uh, let me address metadata. Um, <clears throat> we have um, reporting um, by the Congress and, and NSA that they're forced to go through a FISA process in order to obtain content. But they don't have to go through that for metadata. You have to understand the case that they're basing this decision on, and this is a huge stretch in legal interpretation. I'm no lawyer, but I think any American would agree this is a huge stretch. There was a case in 1979 called Smith versus Maryland that ended up in the Supreme Court over the issue of whether or not, or not a single person's phone number could be used as evidence of a phone call in a, in a contact, and it was essential to the evidence being presented. And uh, the court ruled, yes, you may use that phone number. That incident has been extrapolated to mean somehow the government has the right to gather all of everyone's metadata all the time, aggregate it, and analyze it. That, I don't think, is constitutional, personally. It has to be adjudicated in the courts, and the sooner the better. Unfortunately, the court system is slow in this country. But this is a key fundamental issue of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, plus, yeah. I'd, like to, oh. I'd like to add that uh, it, it, when Congress uh, is saying, you know, the intelligence committee says, well, it's just the number. We just have the number. We don't have the name. Well, you do a reverse lookup on the web. I mean, easy enough to find out the name, address, and all that. All that information, not just about you, but about your entire community, because they have your entire community, too. It's not just you. It's everybody you have a relationship to in the phone network or in the IP network, you know, in the Internet. They have those relationships. So it's not just a number. I'll just say this. I won't say more. There are other, yet other programs that do content. It's a red line. They'll, they're only going to remember, here's the rule. We will acknowledge up to the point of any public disclosures that we can no longer deny, while we'll continue to maintain deniability on everything else. Wittingly. Yes. So content is gold. The cost of technology, especially with NSA's budget, the government budget, is approaching zero. And there is technology right now that allows for vast machine translation of voice communications. Convert it to text and store it. Okay? There are yet other programs. That's all I'll say right now. Let me just, let me just add uh, that content uh, is important in, in, in being able to see a particular event and what's happening there and how you're relating and maybe what you're saying about it. But metadata gives you your entire network, everybody you're related to over a long period of time. You know, for years, I can map out your metadata and your relationships over that time. So, for example, if I wanted to use the IRS to target the, the Tea Party, I have the entire Tea Party mapped out. Who would you like to target? Yeah. Think, That's of, the think of it as human relationship mapping. And remember, the metadata is the index to the content. Right. You don't have metadata without content. That's, that's the heart of any communications. Metadata is trivial, but in the aggregate, I can learn an awful lot about you from the metadata alone. And I would actually mm -hmm. argue that metadata in itself is communications in spite of what the government wants to assert and argue, especially citing the 79 case. I'm just saying again, the government's desperate to protect the fact that they're not only collecting metadata, increasingly they're collecting and storing content. You don't build these vast storage facilities, not just the one at, in Utah, if all you're doing is storing metadata. I could literally store the metadata of the entire world in this room and have space left over. Do you, do you want to say that? One thing that's worth noting is that uh, when we talk about this content metadata distinction, you know, making that kind of binary distinction in the context of a circuit switched phone network kind of makes sense. The, you know, the, the, 
words spoken or the content and the number and the time and duration of the call or the metadata. Uh, on a packet switch network like the internet, that's a much tougher distinction for a couple reasons. Uh, one is just that the structure of internet communications um, and it has multiple layers so that what is metadata at one level is the is the content, you know, the next level down. So you have right the IP or transport level metadata is just a commun you know a communication between these two servers. And then there's the HTTP get request, give you know give me a web page. That's the content relative to that metadata. But then you know another layer down, the content relative to the get request is the web page itself that's delivered. So what you know how far down into the stack do you get to divide between content and metadata. That's in some sense an arbitrary distinction depending on the purpose for your, which you're asking the question. Also, there's just a ton of technical literature showing that you can routinely reverse engineer content from metadata. So if you're looking at the timing of packets moving back and forth, um, if every keystroke is being transmitted, like it is when you, know, you do a, a Google search with auto-suggest, well, you can, if you, you know, look very closely at the timing of those packets and the size of those packets, you can pretty reliably through various complex methods figure out exactly what is in those packets. If you look at the um, shape of the packet flow in a VoIP conversation, you can, again, very often determine what language is being spoken and at about a 50% accuracy rate, determine the presence or absence of particular spoken phrases because you know, words have a different cadence and you can kind of figure out just not even, not even hearing what I'm saying, but from the kind of rhythm, let's say, of the data flow, um, figure out whether it's plausible that I'm saying one thing or another. Um, so that distinction in a whole bunch of ways is, is, is really collapsing in the internet context. Yeah, you would. I'm Tom Devine from the Government Accountability Project. Uh, all the establishment leaders have said that uh, the surveillance whistleblower should have worked within institutional channels. And as your experience has pointed out, that's kind of the you know, recruiting pitch from a bad vibes Pied Piper or something. Uh, um, but we've got another uh, test that's sort of under the public radar screen of that option. Uh, last October, President Obama issued Presidential Policy Directive 19. Uh, and it said that uh, intelligence community employees have free speech rights, and it's illegal to retaliate against them if they work through institutional channels. Uh, but he delegated implementation of those rights to the intelligence units of every federal agency, and the oversight to keep the rights honest has been assigned to NSA uh, and the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, so my question is, uh, for whistleblowers, what is the stakes behind this latest test of authenticity for working within the system? And what will it mean for whistleblowers if the administration flunks this test? They've already flunked it. It's, an ex it's a disclosure policy for whistleblowers. That's all it is. It puts, it puts a red target right on your back and on your front. That's all it is. It's, it's a complete, uh, it's total hypocrisy. Look at Section G uh, of that presidential directive. A whistleblower has no, he has no other recourse. It's left up to the agency. So if you decide to disclose, you're already a, you're already a marked person. So why would you want to work within the system? There's no reason to. There isn't. Because you will be flagged immediately. Well, and, and I think you want, you know, we had this discussion of whether or not you all ought to be using uh, encryption. And it's necessitated, if you think about it, by the fact there is no viable path for whistleblowers built into the government process. If there were, you wouldn't have to be worried about uh, encryption, would you? It would be open and it would be adjudicated and given uh, its day in court and so forth. We have no process. It does not exist. Additionally, I would mention that national security and intelligence whistleblowers have been specifically excluded from the Whistleblower Protection Act, which is another argument for why Snowden absolutely did the right thing. I have one more question. Right. I'm Ray McGovern from Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Uh, my question pertains to blackmail. There are credible reports out there that uh, Obama, Dianne Feinstein, 
and <coughs> others uh, have been wiretapped, eavesdropped upon. Uh, this hasn't been mentioned here or pretty much anywhere else. It seems to be credible. Uh, what about blackmail? It, does this help to explain why a person like Dianne Feinstein is uh, so, well, acting like Dianne Feinstein? Look, yeah, I won't speculate on Dianne, on Dianne Feinstein, but if you look back through the church committee reports, you find uh, cases where, in you know, inter internal FBI memoranda, you find, I think it was uh, something written by uh, Carla Deloach, a famous sort of aide of Hoover's, saying, well, you know, we've been having a lot of trouble with this particular senator on the Appropriations Committee, uh, but uh, fortunately we were able to make him aware that we had knowledge that he had been out at two in the morning uh, with a woman other than his wife, and uh, ever since that we haven't had any trouble with him on appropriations. Um, there is, let's say there, there is precedent um, uh, in, in, in the bad old days for uh, the use of secret information to uh, pressure uh, uh, potential political adversaries. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't want to speculate whether anything remotely like that continues to occur, but it certainly wouldn't be the first time. It's extraordinarily tempting <coughs> if you're operating in secret and you have access to practically every form of communication that exists, that if you decide you want to blackmail somebody, you have information that you could use against them. And if you're confronted by it, then, I mean, I'm, I, I can tell you on a personal level, I was confronted with a particular email from the FBI that was handed to them by NSA. It was during my phase in which I was cooperating. And what they said, oh, we have this email here that you set up a war room at NSA, and you're in a conspiracy with others at NSA and outside of NSA against the United States of America. A war room? I looked, I looked at the FBI agent who was taking the notes. I said, you know what that, that, that email really consists of? The war room was something that NSA did to deal with Congress. They set, they set up an a air-gapped room with a separate computer network to deal with the 9-11 congressional investigations. And the joke was, who were we at war with? Terrorism or Congress? The answer was obvious. The NSA was putting far more effort into dealing with what they wanted Congress to hear and to obstruct justice than they were in actually fighting terrorism. Why would they have commandeered one of the main executive conference rooms at NSA to deal with it? And yet I was the one that was accused of having set up a war room inside NSA. This is what happens. It's not just blackmail in terms of whether it's true or not. It's what they can, how they can reframe, recast the truth in their own interests, and then blackmail you. And let me just add one, one very quick point. As somebody who, who worked on Capitol Hill a, a number of years ago, when you read a story like you saw yesterday, where the, or two days ago, the, he, the, uh, the head of the NSA, General Alexander, was on Capitol Hill to ha hold secret meetings to lobby against the bill to essentially limit surveillance at the NSA, and that these are meetings without staffers, these are meetings obviously not in public, these are meetings with, with lawmakers. What, what I would say is that having worked with a number of politicians on campaigns, having worked in the U.S. House, is that it's not necessarily, a, let's put it this way, it, it's rarely, whether in lobbying or on, this, on a, any kind of issue or in this in specific, it's rarely an explicit form of, if you want to call it blackmail or you want to call it pressure, it's more implicit. It's what, what does the lawmaker what does the rank and file, in this case congressperson, fear that they, that they don't know? They know they're meeting with the head of the NSA. They know what's been disclosed about the NSA. They know what the NSA might know about them. So a lot of times there's less of a, if you don't, if you don't do this, I'll disclose your emails kind of explicit nature. There's, it's the chilling effect. It's the chilling effect of knowing what could be known. And that, in a sense, is almost deliberate. I think that there's a part of this story in which a lot of the disclosures, even though the government is prosecuting these disclosures, I think there's a school of thought that says that within the NSA, within the, within the government, that they don't, there are people there who don't necessarily mind that this is out in the public sphere because it creates a chilling effect that then exists without having to explicitly 
pressure people. And look, we know in the last couple of years, we know that the, uh, the I mean, there was that big Rolling Stone report by Michael Hastings about the government deploying psychological operations against U.S. senators over in, in Afghanistan when they went and visited there. All of that creates an environment in which the average rank and file lawmaker, if not is being directly blackmailed, knows what potentially could be thrown up against them if they make too much trouble. If I could say 15 seconds. Um, if we want to know, and I'm not going to speculate about what's going on behind the scenes, but if we want to know what's going on behind the scenes, one of the main ways to do that is to increase reporting requirements. Um, the, la the only two reports that we got about how NSLs were being used by the FBI showed gross abuses, and we'll never get another one because they're not mandated by Congress. Set up a new church committee to find out what's going on right now and have somebody investigate in depth how the NSA is using its authority, how the FBI is using its authority, and have that published, because that's how we're going to get more information about what's going on in these agencies, what's going on in Congress, and how they're interacting. If I could just add one thing here. Uh, I read in, an, in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago about an East German lieutenant colonel who used to be in the East German Stasi, the secret police in East Germany. And he, he was commenting about the surveillance of the uh, NSA, uh, the programs that we have, and he said this is something that would be a dream come true for us. So this is telling you the state of our country, where we're heading and what we're doing. Uh, I think, well, let me take one, one last question. Okay. Conrad Martin, the Constitutional I'm just really interested in the track on here towards the end, because you asked the question, what's changed in the press? And I think that we were starting to also talk about what's changed in the Congress. Mm -hmm. And if you roll back the clock to the Ellsberg disclosures and to the Pentagon Papers, Mike Gravel stood and read them into the public record so that they were protected. The New York Times and 10 newspapers, when the injunction was filed to stop it, they said, we're gonna continue to print it even after they go after the New York Times. And it was a stand down between Congress and the fourth estate and against, a, against the executive at that time. And I think the question is what's happening now? Why are we not seeing in the case of Snowden, and the, yesterday's vote was extraordinary. I mean, it was eight votes. But why are we not seeing in the case of Snowden, someone, Rand has made an outstanding statement in his defense saying, come back read the things that he feels can be read into the congressional record, have a way in which he can, and, and I'm, I'm speculating here in part, but the larger question is, where is the Congress on this? And also, what's happened in a number of instances here, you've talked about Diane Rourke, and it's been out of context. I don't know if everyone knows who Diane Rourke is. I mean, you all went to the staff director of the House Intelligence Committee, right? And her house ends up, right? And her house ends up being rousted as well as yep. yours. So there's serious separation arguments that are going on here. And I think there's been an acquiescent Congress and how we start to call upon Congress to demand this information and say, no more in our name without our knowledge. And if you're gonna have a vote that was as close as it was yesterday, right? Hopefully they're gonna have hearings on yep. what is in that information what is in, what are in those disclosures on our behalf, and I'm sorry for going on too long, but I do think it's an important, Absolutely. important yeah. direction that the conversation. Yeah. Okay, well thanks very much for coming. I think we're just about out of time. Uh, I agree with what Conrad yeah. said. I mean, I think yeah, wanna... I, yesterday was extraordinary mm -hmm. with the vote on the Amash Amendment to defund the secret surveillance programs of NSA. Mm -hmm. This vote was came down to, it, there was only a 12-person difference. It lost, but it, it was pretty extraordinary. It was a kind of robust debate that I think we've needed to have over the last decade. Um, and I agree with Amy. I mean, I really feel like we need something akin to the church committee um, at this moment in time. We're in an extraordinary confluence of events with Bradley Manning's closing today, the Amash Amendment yesterday, what's happening in your case, Jim, with Snowden, with Julian Assange, with two people who've been granted asylum 
from the United States. I mean, we really need to look at what's going on, and I do feel like we're in a constitutional moment and should take advantage of that. Do we have more time, or should I? I don't know. I think we're gonna, we're gonna have to wrap up there. Okay. I wanted to thank everybody on the panel, uh, and thank you all for coming. And also to say that uh, many of the panelists I know will be available for at least a few minutes afterwards if you wanted to talk to them individually. Thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> you.